Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we are making a special episode in preparation for Freefall. So what we're doing here is we're going to do, we, we got to make sure we give everything its due diligence and its due time for air. Freefall is a 90 minute long episode and there is no way we can do guest stars and music, which are crucial to Miami Vice in the same time as we do the rundown. So this week, to get prepared for the rundown, we're going to do who wrote it, who directed it, all the guest stars, all the music that happened in Freefall, because it is such a big deal that we're going to separate all of that stuff out. And then next week, we'll get just straight into the rundown and our final thoughts on Freefall, because this is just it's such a massive episode. This is kind of our series finale pre-show. Exactly. That's a perfect way to put it. The pre-show, we're getting ready for the series finale where we want to go deep on free fall and make sure we give it all the attention that it deserves. This week, we're going to cover the first half of free fall when it comes to all the guest stars and music and everyone behind the camera. And then next week, we'll just do the episode breakdown. Let's get right into it with this, that free fall originally aired on May 21st, 1989, which is obviously before the lost episode. So the date sequence, I know it's out of order, whatever. It is written (laughs) by Scott Shepard. And Ken Solars, who have worked together on previous episodes, including Redemption in Blood, Bad Timing, Hard Knocks. They've worked together on those ones. And then there's a bunch of other episodes that they've worked on individually as well. But there's also a third writer. And this is where it gets a little interesting. The third writer is listed as Frank Holman or Holman. Now, this, it, it, follow me here. Just follow me for a second. Frank Holman was a character on Crime Story played by Ted Levine. So he's a character on Crime Story. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Did his character write in his spare time? Like... Well, Ken Solars wrote for Crime Story. Now, huh, he's a writer on this episode, and a character appears as a listed as a writer in this episode, too. And both these shows were helmed and created by Michael Mann. Do you, I mean, maybe? Do you think? Because there's no there's no other writer listed as Frank Holman in the history of the show. Do you think Frank Holman mm. is Michael Mann? <laughs> <laughs> I think we've already had enough like pseudonym writers know that not everyone wanted to put their name on uh, these episodes. <laughs> true, true. It could be any number of previous writers who have written a bunch of episodes that just didn't want their name like to be influenced. It could be Dick Wolf for all we know. Yeah, who knows? I mean, that would break crime story thread here that it might be Michael Mann. I'm choosing to believe that it's Michael Mann. Michael Mann. Yeah, Mm -hmm. that's what I'm choosing to believe. Maybe Michael Mann decided since it was the series finale that he'd get in and get his hands a little dirty and write a couple jokes. Blow something (laughs) up. It is directed by Russ Mayberry, who also directed Over the Line. If you remember when we talked about that episode, he is like TV director royalty. He's directed hundreds and hundreds of tv episodes across dozens of tv shows what this all boils down to is that we got a really good cast behind the camera for making this episode so i guess the guess, the question is is do the guest stars live up to that <laughs> and we have quite the list of guest stars that make an appearance in this episode i'm not going to be ashamed to say it follows typical vice fashion where some people make are making repeat appearances and i would be let down if there weren't some of them just to be clear what we're going to talk about now is we're going to talk about our guest stars we're going to talk about our music we're going to wrap this week up that way we can come back next week and give our full rundown on freefall let's go ahead and just dive right into it and let's take a look at this week's guest stars all right john this list is big and there's some name mix match that we were talking about in the big in our pre-secret show that you know, it may be a little hard to follow based on character names from previous episodes. What do you got for us this week, John? Yeah, we got quite the laundry list of guest stars. Now, you can determine the quality at the end of the segment <laughs> of how good of guest stars we got. Dive in here. Let's start with Ian McShane, who plays General Manuel Bourbon. Not spelled like the drink, not to be confused. <laughs> and you might remember him because he also played Esteban Montoya. In the episode, Knock, Knock, Who's There? Question. Why do you think an Englishman plays primarily Hispanic actors on Miami Vice? <laughs> I don't understand why they made him Hispanic. <laughs> I, I don't know, because he's... They assumed that he could. Although it's got to I mean, sound funny with a British accent. 
<laughs> not <laughs> not knocking. He's a good actor, but you know, it's just a little weird. <laughs> Yeah, well, he's a British actor. You know him from yeah, shows like Deadwood. He also appeared in episodes of Magnum P.I. in Dallas. Some pretty big movies. We Are Marshall, The John Wickley's Death Race. Massive. <laughs> well, we don't need to spend too much time on him. We already talked about his Britishness. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to Robert Beltran, who plays Captain Jimenez. 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 <laughs> we'll cover all of those possible. <laughs> He's a U.S. actor for his role as known for his role as Commander Chakotay in Star Trek Voyager, which I've been watching a lot of Star Trek Voyager reruns. Very underestimated in the Star Trek. No surprises from this side of the microphone that John's re-watching Voyager reruns. <laughs> <laughs> his first movie appearance was 1981's Suit suit with Edward James Olmos. So we've already got a vice uh, connection. He also had a supporting role as Chuck Norris's partner in the movie Lone Wolf McQuaid in 1983, nice. which apparently was the basis for Walker, Texas Ranger. Yeah. That's the basis for that show? Yep. He's supposed to be Lone Wolf? Yeah. That's, that's I see that show through a whole different lens now. Yes. Oh my. You've never seen Lone yes. Wolf, huh? I have. I have seen oh, Lone okay. Wolf McQuaid. But I, I didn't know that for a Walker, Texas Ranger, that's supposed to be like the same character. He's seen, he's done some shit. Yeah, he's seen it all. I, I don't think he's that Christian anymore. <laughs> <laughs> also, he's got AIDS. So outside, <laughs> so outside of that, he had a recurring role as Jerry Flute in seasons three and four of B.O.'s series Big Love. He also founded the East L.A. Classic Theater Group. He's dedicated a lot of time to uh, theater. Thanks. Our next guest star is Sherman Howard. He plays Colonel Andrew Baker. I mean, that name sounds an awful lot like he's in charge of a different type of group. <laughs> you know, the ones that wear pointy hats. Sherman Howard yeah. and Andrew <laughs> Baker sound like fake names. <laughs> he began his career on the soap opera General Hospital. So Sherman Howard, this whole next part of his career is going to read like 75% of the guest stars Vice has as far as <laughs> Vice connections. His other TV include L.A. Law. Quantum Leap, The Adventures of Superboy, Walker, <laughs> Texas Ranger, Nash Bridges, Star Trek, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager, Law and Order, and Persons of Interest as <laughs> wow. for TV. Yeah, so pretty much just, let's just hit every possible TV show that shows up in, in my guest stars. I mean, that hits all Including of Adventures of Superboy, which I still have not <laughs> found a connection to. It hits all of them except for Crossing Jordan. Yeah, and I'm disappointed, guys. I could not, no matter how hard I tried, find a Crossing Jordan in these guest stars. I got one for you, John. In the Oscars, Mahershala Ali won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor, and he made repeat appearances in Crossing Jordan. Yes, we have a <laughs> Crossing Jordan reference. <laughs> so Sherman Howard's also done some extensive voice acting, stuff like the Jumanji animated series, Batman Beyond, Superman, a number of video games. And then from the movie standpoint, his biggest three would be K-9, Lethal Weapon 2, and Beyond the Night. Our next guest star is Greg German with two ends. <laughs> he plays Johnny Ramone, best known for his roles as Richard Fish in Ally McBeal from 97 to 02, and Eric Rico Moyer in the series Ned and Stacy from 95 to 99, whatever the hell that was. Maybe we got it wrong here. Very white. Yeah, because um, like, from Ally McBeal, like, I know who that is. Hey, you know what Ally McBeal and NYPD Blue have in common? They like to show their ass off. True story. So he's seen okay. a lot of asses. Yeah. So, <laughs> we've had a debate. We are unsure of the character's name being Johnny Ramon or possibly Johnny Ramen, like the noodles. <laughs> um, That's what John wants it to be. <laughs> so we're going to go with Ramen. <laughs> <laughs> he also played Tom Crane in ten ep in a ten episode special of Law and Order or Vice Connections, and he played Hades in season five of Once Upon a Time. Pretty sure, based on how many actors have made appearances in some sort of Law and Order thing, that maybe Dick Wolf has like some sort of commune, like a cult where you have to live all, on the yeah. grounds. Yeah, 
and then he just like makes them appear in TV episodes. Or no, no, other see, I it- view Wolf as like a mobster, and everyone he gives an acting job to, they are required to do all of his other shows and give a portion of their pay to him. I was gonna no? say, I know you're going with this. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> Or maybe they just actually like working with him, and that's why they continue to no, do it. No, <laughs> no, nonsense, nonsense. I no, believe no. that when all of these actors no. are, appear in that new show, FBI, which is probably in Chicago or something, <laughs> that Chicago <laughs> FBI, <laughs> yeah, that they'll, they'll all be the same actors. And it's because like if you talk to them backstage, like they won't let me leave. Dick Wolf comes to my house. <laughs> we all know what that means. He's a Scientologist, then. <laughs> <laughs> i'm seriously i'm waiting for like chicago transit authority or like chicago <laughs> impound yard that would be the good one craig's first role was in the teen comedy 86 teen comedy the whoopee boys <laughs> okay <laughs> and apparently that was enough to get him a role in child's play 2 which would then lead to more work including the role on ned to stacy and ally mcbeal one of his earliest acting roles was an abc after school special called high school narc <laughs> <laughs> i am willing to bet he played the narc yeah i was gonna say he was the narc for sure more of michael madness he was in dick wolf Connections. He was in L.A. Law and five episodes of Law and Order SVU and 23 episodes of something called Sweet Justice. Sounds awesome. <laughs> and 112 episodes of Remember When. And when being W-E-N-N in all capitals, which apparently was an AMC show from 96 to 98. For only two years, 12 episodes is a lot. <laughs> Other movies are Clear and Present Danger, So I Married an Axe Murderer. And before you say, like, oh, that's a big movie, like, he played the concierge. Oh. <laughs> Talladega Night. He was also in Quarantine, which is a very underrated horror movie. And The Sandlot 2, which I didn't know that they made a Sandlot 2. Yeah, it didn't get, like, I don't think they released it in theaters. It was, like... Christmas it's story too. Or... Video. It's when they gotta get smalls right. out of rehab. <laughs> <laughs> so our next guest star is Elpidia Carrillo, who plays Felicia. She actually has a crazy early life. She was born in Santa Elena, Michoacan. She's one of eight kids from a family of farm laborers. Her dad was murdered when she was four. Damn. Her older brother took charge of the family, forged a birth certificate so she could go to school. And then at six years old, her brother was gunned down outside of a movie theater. Damn. She'd go on, she'd go live with her sister and work at a Chinese food restaurant. And then I assume while working at the Chinese food restaurant, I discovered at like 12 or 14, she had a long career in Mexican cinema. She also appeared as Maria Pendroza in the episode To Have and a Hold. So she is another repeat oh, character, by the okay. way. So after years of me- of doing Mexican cinema, her first U.S. movie was in 1980's The Border. She would go on to do other movies Beyond the Limit, Predators 1 and 2. Now I know who she is. She was also in a 2004 Mexican movie called The Day Without a Mexican, which I've actually seen and is actually a wonderful movie. Movie. Our next guest star, Maria Strova. She plays Bianca Bourbon. Her only other appearances were in the TV shows The Ellen Bergston Show, Equal Justice, and Baby Talk, and then movies Dead Women in Lingerie, Doll Man, <laughs> Reservoir Dogs, Jewel of the Nile. To clarify, in Reservoir Dogs, she play- she didn't actually appear. Okay, she played same. the background <laughs> radio voice. And also, the Jewel of the Nile, I believe, was uncredited because I didn't show up on her IMBD. So, but it does show up in her biography of herself. So maybe she's lying. <laughs> I mean, if I wrote myself, I, I, I was in Goodfellas. I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, I've appeared in a lot of movies. Also, what appears in the biography of herself that I read, she also combines ballet with veil and belly dancing. She's produced several DVD instructional DVDs that she's recently released. So she's got a whole career teaching women how to belly dance and how, and somehow, somehow, that all has to do with some with pregnancy. She will come to your birthday party. You just call five yes. five. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> so our next guest star is Renee Rivera, who plays Amandez. He 
He was another difficult one to research, but I caught an article about him. He's married to a uh, playwright, Stacy Martino. They have two kids. In 2010, one of them wrote, and he starred in a one-man play that's kind of a self-bio of going from the barrio to the stage. Outside of that, he showed up in movies Carlito's Way as the bartender, and then in movies Sturbia, Lords of Dogtown, and It Could Happen to You. TV, he's been three episodes of General Hospital, a TV movie called Komodo vs. Cobra, which I'm assuming the Komodo would win, because Komodo dragons are massive, and Cobras aren't very big. Komodo dragons are also venomous. Yeah, they have poison. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing is they're both venomous, but the Komodo dragon's like three times the size and just as fast. Yeah. Like, I don't see how Cobra has any shot here. Demetrius has that book. Oh, yeah? There's a book called really? Komodo versus... There's a book King. first? <laughs> yeah, it's like a what if, you know, kids what if book. <laughs> I think, it's, I think it's straight from the They made it into a TV movie. <laughs> exactly. And then, of course, our vice regulars. He appeared in an, a single episode of NYPD Blue, Nash Bridges, and Law and & Order. Because it wouldn't oh. be right if he didn't. Exactly. Exactly. I'm telling you. They're all missing a patch of hair. And there's a okay. microchip put underneath but, the skin. But Dick Wolf didn't do have anything to do with NYPD Blue. So that's I just know. A, but the Law & Order. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> he's all up in that. No. So our next guest star is a vice regular and i'm sure like they they just did a lottery of characters who appeared at least three times in the series and he won so he got to be in the last episode <laughs> his name is Edo alvarez calderon you might remember him from episodes baby blues where he plays eduardo vasquez or deliver us from evil where he played lewis or asian cut where he played carlos escobar hmm. this one he plays caesar montoya not to be confused with Esteban Montoya, who Ian McShane played in the episode Knock Knock Who's There. <laughs> but in this episode, he plays General Manuel Bourbon. Now, uh, uh, now that everyone's straight, no one's confused at all and about the Montoyas and the Calderones in the episode. It's not Calderon as in more Calderon storyline. Nope. No. Uh, so he's been in TV movies and pretty much nothing you've ever heard. Uh, movies <laughs> The Lost City and A Dark Truth. TV The Magic City and Clinton and Nadine. Clinton and Nadine, that classic Last TV show about Nadine. <laughs> Our next guest star is Robert Fields. He plays Chief Richard Highsmith. He also portrayed Chief Richard Highsmith in the episode Over the Line. And you might remember from that guest stars that his first movie was the 1958 The Blob. He also did that ridiculously named Western They Shoot Horses, Don't They? <laughs> and something called for Mr. Good Bar, which I'm assuming is about a candy bar. I didn't put it together, and now I just all of a sudden I just did that the same director did over the line where we discovered that the chief of police is crooked. Is the director that's back to finish off that storyline? Yes. Robert Fields TV is an episode of Kojak and an episode of Law and Order. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you, <laughs> someone out there, if you run into someone, I'm just gonna say this: if you live in Hollywood and you run into someone at a bar and they're all, and you ask them, "What do you do?" They're like an actor. Like, okay, well, what have you appeared in? Because I'm sure you hear that all the time. Like, oh, I've been in three episodes of Law & Order. Ask to see the back of their head if they have a <laughs> patch of hair missing where the microchip's been implanted into their scalp. Run a magnet over their over the back of that their brings, hands or the, or the back of their head. So that brings us to our final guest star, Anna Katarina, who plays Bourbon's fiance. They, they didn't even give her an actual name. She just plays <laughs> Bourbon's fiance. <laughs> she is a Swiss actress. She was the daughter of cellists mm. and is a classically trained pianist. I thought I was going to screw both up. <laughs> uh, she came to the U.S. in her 20s and joined a circus and acting school. Go with that for a minute. <laughs> I go to school and I every bet you day she all, can all, all that happens is I'm surrounded by clowns. Every day at school, nothing but clowns. <laughs> I bet you she can juggle while standing on a ball. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> She would act in theater, uh, her biggest role being in the play Tamara, which would land her acting roles. She played the poodle lady in Batman Returns. <laughs> that was me. I was the poodle lady. Her classically trained music parents, successful music parents, her classically trained piano play, and her schooling at the clown in music school or whatever <laughs> she was going to in, in animal ESP or whatever school she was going to paid off so much 
that she was the poodle lady. The poodle lady. In Batman Returns. <laughs> Batman. <laughs> she was also in six episodes of HBO's Boardwalk Empire. So that's a little bit better. That is better. But from what I've seen of Boardwalk Empire, because we gave up like halfway through no, the first. No, you gave up. Let's get that straight. Uh-huh. I liked it. You gave up like three episodes in because yeah. that's what you do with shows. Uh-huh. <laughs> But what I know of Boardwalk Empire is that if you're a woman on that show, you're going to be naked and you're probably going to be sucking someone's... Or dead, either one. <laughs> <laughs> I gave up after the second season, so I'm right there with you. You made it further than we did. We only made it to like episode four. <laughs> just like by the end of the second season, it was just like, like it's just taking so long for some of these things, for some of the stuff to unfold. It was like, I just can't wait. It was the first show that I watched where I was like, yeah, this is too much humping. I've, this is too much. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like at a certain point, like you, you got to stop having sex and get to the storyline. <laughs> Outside of the six episodes for Boardwalk Empire, can you guys guess what she she also appeared in? Single episodes of what? Uh, Law and Order, NYPD Blue, <laughs> and Nash Riches, <laughs> or Quantum Leap. No. Close. <laughs> You got Law and Order right. She was also Law and Order Criminal Intent because there's, usually there's more than one Law and Order. <laughs> Star Trek Next Generation. And then a few different ones. Okay. A little mix up. Uh, the TV movie Death of the Incredible Hulk. What the hell? Uh, the Pink Panther remake. <laughs> and the movie The Conjuring in 2013. So. Uh, we don't oh. talk about that movie. Up. Yeah, we don't talk about that movie. That movie <laughs> scared the bejesus out of us. Yeah, it did. <laughs> After all of that, the very last thing I want to include in my last guest stars in the podcast is that this will be the final appearance of Izzy, played by (laughs) the legendary Martin Ferrero, who is, by the way, also the star of huge movie Jurassic Park. I mean, they killed the wrong person. I mean, they if should they have killed Jeff Goldblum. Hey, hey, and he hey. would have been Jeff Goldblum's character, the movie would have blown up. I mean, it was kind of hampered, actually, by Jeff Goldblum's performance. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it wasn't that popular. I'm just <laughs> saying, I'm just saying, he made that movie. If you're listening to this podcast, just know that he, he is the star of that movie. So. And everything that he does, including... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be sad to see why not talk about these episodes and not see Izzy anymore. It is sad. An underrepresented character in seasons four and five. Yeah, very true. Especially yes. four. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know what I'm also surprised by is the guest stars that didn't appear in this episode. You know who didn't appear uh, as Orlando Calderon or maybe some other character? John Leguizamo. He was done by now. He had played too many characters. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, he was just in this season. I mean, (laughs) or how about Luis Guzman? Stanley Tucci. Yes, Stanley Tucci. That's another good one. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, you know, there's some people that uh, really surprised they didn't make an appearance in this episode. That is the list of this guest stars. And John, just take a moment. That's like a standing clap for you and covering all. 108 episodes of Miami Vice and every guest star that has ever appeared in an episode. Very worthy job that you have done over these three years to recap all of these guest stars and and all of their Law and Order appearances. (laughs) And Crossing Jordan. (laughs) Thank you. So thankful. I have such an abundance knowledge of information that isn't even worthy for a board game. (laughs) Miami Vice guest stars board game. <laughs> but it sounds pretty specific. I don't know who'd buy it, but <laughs> come up with it. I'm just saying, Grenade Rivera or Alfredo Alvarez Calderon are not going to be answers on no. any uh, Trivial Pursuit questions. <laughs> Even the hardest Trivial Pursuit will never ask that question. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I know Julian Roberts' middle name, damn it. <laughs> Well, all right, let's go talk about this week's music then, because we know that, hey, this was the last guest star. This also means it's the last true music segment. Now, I know we'll be back, have John to talk about music from season five and then music as a whole throughout all of Miami Vice. But let's take a look at the last Vice episode and the last music segment of this show. All right, John, I took a quick peek at this week's music, and I'm really excited about it because I've seen some Names that I've never seen before, some names that we've had before, and a Don Johnson song. What do you got for us this week? All right, let's just get right, let's just get that right out of the way. No Way Out by Tim Truman and Don Johnson was exclusively recorded for Vice. It did not chart. It was not released in anything else outside of the episode for Vice. 
That is it. That is all. The <laughs> fact, what seems funny to me, is that in, for the final episode, they said, hey, Don, do you want to make a song with, with, with Tim? He was like, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure somewhere on set, Tubbs was like, hey, can I make a song? They were like, no, sorry, Tubbs. <laughs> yeah, I know. Why do you think they didn't have them make a song together? Like, could you imagine that? Oh That's my God. God. I'm wondering. They missed such a huge yeah. opportunity. Like, why didn't they make a song together? <laughs> somebody thought somebody was too good for the I other feel- one. <laughs> John, and I think I, I, think I know said, which way it went, but just saying, somebody <laughs> thought he was too big for the other one. He's like, I don't have time to be in your music to help you. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sorry. I cannot help Philip Michael Thomas's music career as Milhouse's dad from The Simpsons. <laughs> that she's got a tape of somebody lend me a feeling and no one in Vice wants to play it. <laughs> he got fired from the Cracker Factory. <laughs> <laughs> well, we would be remiss if we didn't mention in the last music segment that Don Johnson had a charting song, a number one song uh-huh. that I talked about on This Week in Vice, and PMT's music was received poorly and failed to produce a single hit. <laughs> and I never had a PM- PMT album. I had Don Johnson's album. Yeah. Yeah. It sold poorly and, f- and failed to produce a single hit. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's kind of rough, man. It's the final episode, and you find out that they're gonna let Don Johnson do a song, like and like it's like it was recorded exclusively for Vice. Like this isn't like Don Johnson's pimping a CD. They specifically asked him to do this song with Tim Truman, and specifically <laughs> excluded Tubbs. <laughs> yeah, even though he also has released albums and is still releasing albums at this point in his career. <laughs> Okay, now that we got that out of the way, let's get to some of the actual music. We have Year Zero by King Swamp. They're a British rock, ba- rock band. They're made up of Walter Ray on vocals, Dave Allen on bass, Steve Hollowell on keyboards, Dominic Miller on guitar, and Martin Barker on drums. They were formed in 1988 in London after Alan and Barker had parted ways with their previous band Shriekback. Halloway and Cozy would eventually be featured on the uh, second album. They are also former members of Shriekback. So this is basically Shriekback continued <laughs> after they broke up. Gotcha. <laughs> but it's a very short-lived band. Their first album produced, uh, their first single actually, uh, Is This Love, reached number 21 on the rock chart. And so their first album actually did pretty well. So they released two albums and sev- several singles, but after former members Halloway and Cozy joined in for the second album, uh, it did not do well. It failed to chart anywhere in the U- U.S. or U.K., and was panned by critics, which would lead them to this band in 1990. Follow me, I think that quitters, because even though it didn't <laughs> chart in the US or the UK, it doesn't mean that they couldn't have released it in Australia and New Zealand and made a ton of Kiwis. <laughs> they didn't try hard enough. They gave up. That's exactly what happened. Yes. So, post-band, Ray and Hollowell would eventually become part of Ray's daughter's Lily Ray backing band, the Saturday Girls. Ray also did some producing. He produced one of Dominic Miller's albums. Dominic Miller, he would go on as a session musician and record with some pretty big names like The Pretenders, Phil Collins, Paul Young, and a band called Level 42. But since 1991, Dominic Miller has recorded and toured primarily with Sting. Oh, yeah, I have. <laughs> so yeah, Dominic Miller is Sting's guitarist basically. Uh yep, since 91. That's what I do. So pretty much since Sting Sting was popular. Dave Allen who played bass, he actually got kind of went corporate and, and uh I think currently works for Apple. So he's a tool. <laughs> Do you know who the executives are of, of Beats and Apple Music? Is obviously uh, Dr. Da- Dre, but what's his name from Nine Inch Nails? Trent yeah, Reznor. Dominic, do you, do you want to know what Alan does for Apple? After they acquired Beats, they hired him as like president of digital music uh, yeah. or something. Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly what they did for he Trent with, Reznor and stuff. Yeah, yeah. He, so this guy from the band King Swamp, he's one of the like C, CFOs or something with Trent Reznor and Dr. Dre. Uh, Martin Barker also did a bunch of session work, most notably with Robert Plant, who we will talk about later in music. But let's move on to one of our big guests. We have the song Crying Shame by Lyle Lovett and his large band. I love, 
I hope the band lives up to its name. To, to clarify, Lyle Lovett and his large band is the name of Lyle Lovett's third album. It was released in 1989. His large band, I think, is what he called his backing band, but the only time it was ever referenced out, the only time he was referenced as anything other than Lyle Lovett was because that's, that was the name of the third album. I am disappointed mm. now. But that's not going to stop me from talking about Lyle Lovett. Lyle Lovett is probably best known for being the frog that Julia Roberts kissed, <laughs> hoping it would turn into a prince. Instead of turning into a prince, it would turn into Lyle Lovett, and she would be forced to marry him for two years, because them's the rules for when kissing frogs. <laughs> I'm just saying, they don't all turn into Prince Harry. Sometimes you get stuck with Shrek. <laughs> Seriously, remember, the man looks like what you would have... He looks like had, what you would have... A rooster would look like if turned into a human. <laughs> just remember, she could have had the king of all drug dealers in South Florida and the head of the trucking union <laughs> in Burnett. In all seriousness, Lyle Lovett has turned out to be a lot... Uh, had a lot more significant career than I thought he did. So he's a country singer, songwriter, and actor, and a horse enthusiast, which should be obvious since he married Julia Roberts. <laughs> Tell me you can't picture him feeding her sugar cubes and carrots. <laughs> He's been active since 1980. He's released 13 albums and 25 singles. His highest charting single is the song Cowboy Man, which topped at number 10 Billboard Hot Country Song Charts. He's won four Grammys, including Best Male Country Vocal Performer and Best Country Album with It's Not Big, It's Large. It's got something to do about size. <laughs> she released in 07. It, it peaked at number two on the album charts. He has actually been in a bunch of stuff as an actor. He's been in everything from episodes of Mad About You and Dharma and Craig to playing himself in Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox story. He played a role, Fear and Loathing, in Las Vegas. Oh, I see. I knew there was something that I recognized He was a road person. He was credited road person. Even as recently as he was in 10 episodes of the TV show The Bridge, in 2013 and 14. He's had songs featured on some pretty big soundtracks. He's he had songs used in the movies Major League 1 and 2, in the TV show Beverly Hills 90210. The song Randy Man did for Toy Story was a duet with him. Oh, wow. He's also a theater actor. He acted in, and composed the music for the play Much Ado About Nothing for an L.A. production. Circling back a little bit, he married uh, Julia Roberts in... Ninety-two, when he met her on filming the movie The Player, they had a three-week romance. They eloped from 93 to 95. And then after they divorced, since late 97, he's been in a relationship with April Kimball. They, all right, so in 97, they started their relationship. In 2003, they got engaged and they got married a mere 14 years later in 2017. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned Lyle Lovett is a uh, horse enthusiast and co-owns and competes in reigning competitions with a world-class horse. I'm assuming is called Smart and Shiny. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, we have Bugle Call Rag by the Glenn Miller Orchestra. They were founded in 1937 by band leader Glenn Miller. They had several hits, including In the Mood, Moonlight Serenade, Tuxedo Junction, and a bunch of others. So here's the thing. Between 1939 and 1942, the Glenn Miller Orchestra was one of the biggest bands in the country with few rivals. They had 16 number one singles and Damn. 69 top 10 hits. Wow. More than Elvis or the Beatles ever accomplished. Like, a lot more. Elvis and the Beatles each only had 30 top, <laughs> only. Hit, top 10 hits. <laughs> Chumps. 69 top. I mean, I get it. It's, it's 1939. It's a different era. This is big band era. It's impressive. Yeah. So in 1942, Glenn Miller would make hiatus from the band. Miller would enlist in the army and join a, and would serve in the Army Air Force Band. While flying to France to entertain the troops, his plane went down over the English Channel he was flying, and I, I believe he was flying himself. It was a single engine plane. He was flying to France to go entertain the troops. His plane went down, and he he disappeared in the English Channel, and they never found him. Is he in Captain America? In <laughs> Is he? I mean, he might be Captain America. <laughs> yeah, 
No. <laughs> in fact, like they didn't immediately announce that he was gone. So it was in 1945, they would recognize it and he would actually be awarded the Bronze Star. He would leave behind a wife and two adopted kids. Wow. But yeah, the Army Air Force Band would be changed to the 314th Regiment almost immediately afterwards. So that not to be associated with the tragedy, which guess what, would be headed up by singer Tony Bennett. Wow. After his disappearance, Tex Benneke would take over as band leader until the Miller estate would replace him in 1956 with Ray McKinley, who had served with Miller in the Army Air Force Band. Since then, the band has had numerous personnel changes, but they continue to perform to this day in 2019, the band leader Nick Hilscher, who's the band leader and vocalist, by the way, Nick Hilscher has appeared in our music before. That one off, caught me off guard. I did not expect that much about Glenn Miller Orchestra. The fact that Glenn Miller is quite possibly the greatest mu- musician in American history, none of us know about him. That Plus, is he was really awarded the Bond Star. Yeah, that is really interesting about how many number one hits they had and how popular they were during the big band era. It's also a sign, I think, that people were desperate for new music. And when Elvis and Chuck Berry and those people came along, like, oh, thank God, I can't handle any more Glenn Miller Orchestra. (laughs) So that brings us to Ship of Fools by Robert Plant as our next song. Robert Plant also appeared in our music for the episodes Junk Love and Fruits of the Poison Tree. All you need to know about Robert Plant is that he is the former lead singer of Led Zepp, and he had a long, successful solo career as well. That's it, you know? If you want to learn more about Robert Plant, go back to the Fruit of the Poison Tree episode. Come on now. He's a big deal. You sh- if you don't know enough about Robert Plant after listening to this show and getting the rundowns, and then also just because you don't know who Led Zeppelin is, shame on you. Shame on you. Yeah. Our next song is Confusion by Genesis. Now, we have talked extensively about the likes of Phil Collins, Peter Gabriel, and Mike Rutherford, but we have not talked about Genesis, the band themselves. I didn't know it was possible to get those three superpowers into a single band. They have, like, special rings or something? So, guys, (laughs) band Genesis was active from 1967 to 1999. They are famous for a music video in which Phil Collins loses his car keys. (laughs) Uh, um, And that's about it. Wait, Genesis continued, all to, known for. continued to be a That's band even while for. the other three were off on their solo careers? <laughs> <laughs> so they were active 67 to 99, and then from 06 to now. They were formed in 67 by Gabriel Rutherford, Tony Banks, Chris Stewart, and Anthony Phillips. Although Anthony Phillips left in the, in 1970 due to health and stage fright. Stewart would be replaced by John Mayhew, who would also uh, leave for health and stage fright, I believe. <laughs> Phillips and Mayhew would be replaced by Collins and Steve Hackett. We would have Genesis, the original. In 75, Peter Gabriel would get a big head and go solo. Collins would take over lead. Hackett would leave in 77. Peter Gabriel only had so many words left in him. He had to leave Genesis so you can make albums like So and <laughs> It or whatever the other album names are. <laughs> well, once Collins was able to push out Gabriel and Hackman, the three-man group con- continued, and in 1978, their album... And then there were three was their first platinum album. Mm. By 1984, Collins would begin his solo side project career, uh, side career. By 1986, their album Invisible Touch would be their biggest selling album. The title track being their first and only number one. This wow. song was also, Land Illusion was also off of this album. It managed to make the top 10. What a shock, actually, that they only had one number one song, considering who has been in that band. Not really, since the band's most known for a song where Phil Collins loses his car keys. <laughs> Just not a whole lot of good stuff came out of these guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't make stuff up. They took a five-year hiatus because they're lazy. And in 1991, <laughs> they released We Can't Dance with the single I Can't Dance, which is their last top 10 single. And that's also what they're known for. I Can't Dance being the song where Collins loses his keys. Also why they probably ended up taking another hiatus after this. They would try and replace Phil Collins, who would go focus on his solo career. They'd try and replace him with singer Ray Wilson. They brought him in for the 96 album, Calling All Stations. 
It did not sell well in the U.S. and led to another hiatus. Then you would have the 06 reunion tours and the Hall of Fame and all of that fun stuff. So there you go. Genesis in a nutshell. Phil Collins loses his car keys. Gabriel gets a big <laughs> head and starts making one with albums. One Phil Collins remark before we break from it forever. Phil Collins, he is in our This Week in Vice for the last time that I do This Week in Vice, this, this episode that just came out. And it covers from the mid-November till the end of 1989. And it just worked out perfectly that I was able to stage it out so that for free fall, the last th This Week in Vice has through the remainder of 1989. So that means that it's officially 1990. There's no reason to keep doing the show. The last song that reaches number one in 1989, the number one song on the Billboard Hot 100 in the whole month of December is Another Day in Paradise by Phil Collins. That's how music ends in the 80s. Fitting. And if you, if you thought my biography of Genesis was a little harsh, understand that Phil Collins, Peter Gabriel, and Mike Rutherford have infested almost every music <laughs> segment for the if, uh, i mean for the first four seasons of the show they appeared more in my music segment than don johnson appeared in the show <laughs> it's true so that brings us to the next song bad attitude by honeymoon sweet honeymoon sweet was also showed up in our episodes one eyed jack and free verse they are the Canadian band who got the break winning the Toronto Radio Contest with the song New Girl Now. They wrote two songs for films Wraith and Lethal Weapon. They're Canadian. Um, yeah. <laughs> that brings us to our final song of the episode. Tell Me by Terry Allen Cap. Guys, I saved this for last. He is an American guitarist and vocalist, best known as one of the founding members of the jazz rock fusion band Chicago Transit Authority, oh, also known as Chicago. Oh, they made they if they worked it out, they did it. They did it, John. If we were close to each other, we could give each other a high five. This episode includes mm -hmm. Peter Gabriel, Phil Collins, Mike Rutherford, Robert Plant, Don Johnson on music, and Chicago. Wow, they did it. They yep. did it. They, they did it. Every they did the single impossible. one. Yep. The only thing that's missing here is David yep. Bowie. Oh, oh, I know. I am sure there. If I dug a little deeper, there has to be a Bowie connection somewhere through here. So, <laughs> but let's get into the Chicago's founding member, Terry Kath. Terry Kath founded Chicago, the Chicago Transit Authority, with Peter Cetera, Bobby Lamb, James Panko. Danny Seraphine and Walter Perizaders. Band was formed from a number of local bands in the area, and they ended up shortening the name to Chicago when the actual Chicago Transit Authority complained. <laughs> you guys suck so bad. We don't want to be associated <laughs> with you. <laughs> You're ruining the name of our buses. <laughs> you are not worthy of a bus stop. The D train through the loop is not happy with you. Keith appeared on Chicago's first 11 albums and a film entitled Electric Glade in Blue in 1973, which featured this song. Kath also played the drums in banjo, and he also played bass in the very in the first bunch of bands he was in before settling on the guitar. He's actually known as like one of the most talented musically of Chicago because he can play like eight instruments. Or he could play like eight instruments. <laughs> you guys know how much I love former band names. So we're going to take a journey. Kath's band names leading up to Chicago, his very his final band. His first band was the Mystics. He would move on from the Mystics and join Jimmy Rice and the Gentlemen. Very he'd move on from Jim from them. Yes, he'd move on from them and join Jimmy Ford and the Executives. This is when he would first meet member the members of Chicago, Walter and uh, Danny. They, the three of them, would then join the cover band Missing Links. They would then change their name to the Big Thing, and that's when band members. Peter Cetera would join the after he would leave the exceptions. And they would finally form Chicago Transit Authority. Kath would write at least one song and would sing at least one vocal on all 11 albums he contributed to. Terry Kath's story comes to a tragic end, though. Mm. In, in 1978, uh, even though he, he was known for drug abuse and having weight and health issues, wasn't that that got him. In 1978, after a party while hanging out 
at, I swear to God, Rhodey, Don Johnson's house. Oh. Not that Don Johnson. So they're hanging out. It's like five o'clock after a party, and they're hanging out at his L.A. home. And this is according, so now, uh, this is going to be according to Johnson. Kath was sitting at the table, and at the time, he was known to like guns, and he liked to uh, shoot guns. And so... He's sitting at the table and he has a 38. It's empty and he's spinning the the gun and putting it to his head and clicking it. Johnson says, hey man, be careful. Kath sets down the gun, picks up a 9mm and literally, according to Johnson's last words were, don't worry about it. Look, the clip is not even in it. He put the not, sat back, put the 9mm to his head, the trigger and blew his brains out. Wow. So he was behind a wife and a daughter, Michelle. His widow, Camelia Emily Ortiz, would later remarry actor Keith Sutherland from 87 to 90. His death almost broke up the band. They went into a deep decline until 1982. They would release the album Hot Streets and the song Alive Again, which would be a tribute to him, their first release since his death. And Chicago would go on to release like 20 more albums. Absolutely crazy. It's a freak accident. Nothing to degrade the tragedy here but i mean clearly could have been prevented turns out even if not a clip in it there might be one in the chamber so and there you go that is your music i am so so thankful that vice was able to put together all of these people into one episode that in the send-off for music it included almost all of our regulars all the ones that just made repeated appearances in music that they got them all to come back. And it was a fun journey. We got to talk about DJ getting another shot at music. We got to make fun of Tubbs a little bit. Got to uh, poke fun and and revisit our Phil Collins and Genesis love-hate relationship. (laughs) We got random orchestra story about World War II. We got Chicago's most tragic and talented member. And I mean, not to mention, like, you were already forgetting about King Swamp and Lyle Lovett at the beginning of the episode. A super duper music episode to send it off. And one last thing I just want to say, I've had a ton of fun doing these music segments. I know I make a ton of jokes and uh, I'm only half serious about most of them. So, (laughs) but I've really enjoyed it. So thank you and good night. John, Vice would not be Miami Vice without the music. And that was something that we recognized very, very early on that what makes Miami Vice What makes it MTV Cops is the music that they picked for the episodes. And I know season five hasn't been the best because they really cut down their budget. But as a whole, when you Mm -hmm. look at all the music throughout all of the episodes, music is crucial. And I think that one of the best things that Mm -hmm. we've done and that you have done in particular is separated music and talked about it for how important it is and that the people that they chose to be in the music how important they are and to give it justice. And I think you've done that over the last three years. I hope so. And I think you're right. No, season five has been weak at times, ended extremely strong. So, well, I know our show wouldn't be the same without the music segment. Although this is our last music segment, I know we're going to talk about music again in our roundup episode. So we still have some chance to talk about some of the music, but we've done 132 episodes now and all of them music have been integrated to every single episode and this one is just as important as but all one. the others oh yeah all but, but one, one. <laughs> but one but we did do a deep dive on music even in that episode so in 132 episodes music is integrated through it and that's through your leadership john thank you so now let's go give our little final thoughts on the music and guest star roundup and then wrap this episode up to get ready for free fall all right, guys, just one little last final goodbye here on the guest stars and the music. I do want to give a shout out to This Week in Vice. We did this week, this Friday, was our last episode ever of This Week in Vice. And if you haven't had a chance to listen to that, I encourage you to at least listen to the last one and hear the final roundup of 1989. It's something that I've done for all 108 episodes of Miami Vice. And you can listen to just what was happening in the 80s when Miami Vice was on the air. And I'm very proud of what. I've been able to accomplish with that. And we aired our final one. And that's just our sign here that we are at the end of Miami Vice and the end of this show. We will be back for free fall. But before we move on on that, John, uh, and we can't really have Melissa join in on this. So we're going to ask her how accurate we're going to be. Based on the guest stars <laughs> and the music, what do you think is going to happen in free fall? What scares me is that 
the only thing I know going into this is that it's a grip from the headlines episode and it has has to do with Noriega, which worries me because I feel like the episodes where we've gotten into like South American politics have been hit or miss. So I'm a little nervous. Um, I feel like being the the last end all be all episode, I was surprised that it was a rip from the headlines. Like I thought it was just been so immediately focused on the vice squad themselves that I didn't think that they would try and do like a rip from the headlines storyline. So I'm a little nervous about it. I will say looking at the music, I am anticipating very, very, very many montages uh, <laughs> uh, with scenes from previous episodes because of some of the overlap from the other episodes. And then looking at the guest stars, I would say that we are probably going to have a corrupt FBI or military person somehow involved, and we are not going to see the ladies at all at any point in the episode <laughs> unless they walk by holding coffee. Those are my predictions. I think you're right. They're going to travel overseas, and we know that the police chief needs to have his come up in whatever that's going to be in the episode. And the Burnett thing has to make a reappearance. There has to be something that comes back up from the Burnett stuff that comes from back around to haunt Sonny, and which is why they travel to South America to do something. And Izzy's involved. So you know it's all going to be good. I'm excited for this last episode. I'm excited for that they actually got to close out the storylines that they did a final episode wasn't just and then they ended they didn't get a chance to actually prepare a final episode but i think that's what i'm going with and with the music i think you're 100 right montage after montage montages yes. in montages <laughs> all right melissa how accurate are we on our on where we think free fall is going montage after montage <laughs> montages of montages now, there's a lot of montages a lot of flashbacks of, like but I'm not going to say anything because I'm not going to spoil it. So from your perspective, what do you think as our vice expert, what do you, what should we watch for? You got to look for the details. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're going to have to remember, like, they're going to call back to a lot of things that happened in the past. Are the pirates going to come back? No, there's oh. no pirates. Sorry. There's no pirates. Oh. But yeah, it's definitely going to be, definitely. and it's going to be a very Frank different. Zappa coming back pirate would have been epic. I'm yeah, I know. It's going to be a very difficult episode for Crockett. Mm. That's all I'll say. <laughs> e U R N E double T. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be bad for him. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm I'm excited for this last one. I'm excited for because of too much too late and seeing some foreshadowing into what's coming in Freefall. I'm excited to see the closure on a whole bunch of stories that are going to happen in this last episode. And we know it's coming that because the Vice team is breaking up and, and and there's no stopping it. Hey, you know they're breaking up. <laughs> <laughs> and that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed our special prequel to Freefall this week. We would love to hear from you. Email us, goWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Check out that website, goWithTheHeat.com. You can find all the ways to contact us. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you know how to get a hold of us. We would love to hear from you before Freefall. Please reach out to us. We want to hear your thoughts, things to watch for, some catch, so, something that you caught that you couldn't believe that happens in that episode. We want to see those things before we get to Freefall and know the things to watch for and the things to talk about when we get there. Check out that website, goWithTheHeat.com, or get that email, goWithTheHeat at gmail.com. We'd also love to see your support. Check out that website, goWithTheHeat.com. Click on support and see all the ways that you can support us. Support number one is we would love to hear from you. Support step number two is go to that podcast, your platform of choice, and give us a review. Give us five stars, four eggplants, seven penguins. I don't know what their rating system is, but go Nine in there. kiwis. <laughs> go in there, leave us the review, and make sure you write in the review about how much you love Phil Collins, Peter Gabriel, and Mike Rutherford, and how you wish that they were in every single episode. <laughs> <laughs> We would love for you to do that because if Miami Vice does its reboot, we will be the only podcast that has covered every episode of the original Miami Vice. And when we come back for the reboot, people will have renewed interest and they can come find out all the details they would ever want to know about Miami Vice right here in this podcast. We'd love for them to be able to find it. So go give us that review. That's going to do it for us this week. 
We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll be back next week with Free Fall and the series finale of Miami Vice. Until then, bye, pals.